Drew, Dr. Drew Lanham, uh, is a professor of wildlife at Clemson University uh, and a respected uh, member of the birding community. Specifically, uh, you've made uh, quite a bit of, uh, I wouldn't say no notoriety, but you are well known as a black birder. And uh, thank you to, for joining us today to talk about both of those things, birding, this being National Bird Feeding Month, but also it being Black History Month, specifically your experience as a black birder. We're very interested to, to know about both of those things. Thank you for having me. What was your, your introduction to birding? What was the moment that, uh, or maybe the species that, that got you interested in it as a, as a pursuit and a hobby? Well, I, you know, growing up in, in rural South Carolina um, and, and living on a farm, it was sort of natural, um, literally and figuratively, to, to, to be surrounded, obviously, by um, by animals, by wildness. And so birds were what sort of enthralled me, kind of pulled me in um, because they could fly and I always wanted to fly. And, um, and, and so I lived vicariously through birds. Um, so many different species. I, I think, um, you know, my grandmother was, my Mamatha was the first person that I ever saw feed birds and throwing handfuls of grits out of her back door to, um, to what she calls snowbirds, juncos, and other sparrows. Then there were the, the blue jays that raided her pecan trees that she shot out of the pecan trees, taught me how to shoot out of the pecan trees, which um, was a pretty horrific way to, to, to come to learn birds. But then um, I, I fell in love with, with bobwhite quail um, not because we hunted them, but because they became very familiar birds to me on my, my walks from my grandmother's house to my parents' house. Bobwhite quail were the, as I like to say, the birds of my boyhood. So they were sort of a spark in a way and, and, and a familiar bird, <clears throat> um, at least at that time. Now they're increasingly rare. Um, but a bird that I knew because of the call, that I knew because of behavior, I knew their habitat, that they liked hanging out in thickety places and some of those places were also great places to pick blackberries for um for blackberry pie so bob white quail were probably um the bird that that sort of sparked this this fascination but later on it became things like prairie warblers or peregrine falcons or loggerhead shrikes just a uh, bird after bird sort of sparks me so it's this constant it's this constant thing you say you know you knew the the call of the bob white quail was it something that you started to internalize some of those things like the calls and the 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 coloration and that sort of thing were you intentional about it from the very beginning or was there a moment at which you transitioned from just a sort of passive appreciation of them and, a, and their ability to fly to actually wanting to to more actively studying them well the the intention uh, was there pretty quickly because i was in books um from a very early age, first the, you know, the the B volume of of my parents' encyclopedia, and then checking out every book I could from the library. I'm um, saving up my money to buy bird books. That's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty intentional, right? Um, so trying to learn more about the birds that I saw, and knowing by I don't know third grade that I wanted to be an ornithologist, or even knowing what an ornithologist was. Um, <laughs> so that, that it, it's been a lifelong thing really of, of just wanting to be, um, to fly and, and knowing that I could not do that unassisted, that doing it vicariously through birds was, was sort of a way to, for me to live this lifelong, this lifelong boyhood dream. So here I am, um, surrounding myself with birds, um, in, in all kinds of ways, books and carvings and paintings and, um, and sound, a clock, <laughs> you know, so uh, writing about them at the moment. So it's, it's always something for me that I can, I can go back to those earliest days in second and third grade and thinking about birds um, and realizing that it was something that was very intentional, but also that I had some people that helped me sort of, um, I guess you could say, cement that intentionality in a way that, that kept me going. 
most birders have you know their their list their list of birds they've they've seen or would like to see is there is there a a gap on that list that you'd like to fill in terms of maybe North American species that uh, you haven't seen or that you would you'd really love to, to add to that list? Wow. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so many birds that I haven't seen. Um, I mean, there there are roughly ten thousand bird species mm -hmm. described in the world. I've seen you know a couple of thousand um, at most. So. I, you know, I, I, I would say that that probably, um, if I had to, to kick out a bucket list, um, it'd be New Guinea, right? It'd be, um, you know, the, the, the Sulawesi kind of, um, world, um, uh, Australia, because it's, it's just so unique. I've spent a little bit of time in the Amazon. I, you know, here in North America, I mean, there's so many great birds especially the the high prairie in Montana and I want to go to those places and and just to see things uh, shorebirds that many of which we're used to seeing only in migration and um, in the winter to see those birds on territory and singing um, you know to to see a sanderling singing um, and calling and exhibiting um, behavior that I've never seen before would be pretty cool so but the, you know, you know there's so many what people would consider sort of common birds that I don't get to see very often. You know, the the evening grosbeaks that are close to you guys right now in Chattanooga. Uh, you know, I've thought about taking a drive over there just so I could see evening grosbeaks because I haven't seen those birds since I was a kid, since I was 10 or 12 years old. So um, yeah, they're exotic birds that I would love to see in exotic places, but they're also really cool birds that are exotic to me because I haven't seen them in a long time and it would be like a reunion of sorts. One of our uh, staff members, our, our curator of forest uh, is his title, but he's a, an enthusiastic birder as well. And he says one of the reasons that he loves um, birds is that they're one of the few vertebrates that you can see on a daily basis that you don't have to go looking for them. They're just all around you. Do you feel like the fact that birds are so sort of omnipresent in our lives, may, do you feel like people who are not birders maybe just don't even see them? They're so frequently seen that they don't see them? The familiar sometimes becomes the forgotten, right? And, and that, um, you know, they, they are omnipresent. I mean, I, I see people, for example, um, in, in, in cities, you know, people just walk through pigeons and buy pigeons. They're just sort of um, the backdrops or ambient sort of life in, in a way, or starlings or house sparrows or, you know, in suburban backyards, people as beautifully vibrant and brilliant as a northern cardinal is that people just say, oh, it's a red bird. And they sort of <laughs> let them go looking for the next best bird. So yeah, that omnipresence um, can can numb us to the wonder of of what it is that they are, but but if you slow down, if you just slow down a bit, it gives you the opportunity to to not just see the bird for a what, but to understand that that bird has unique characteristics as an individual. That if you see two cardinals, two male cardinals side by side, you can tell the difference between them. It just takes a little bit of slowing down to observe the the differences in in redness, or one has a perkier crest than the other, or um, one has a slightly longer beak, uh, behaves differently, approach or will or aggressive um, at at the feeder towards other birds. So I think it takes some of that slowing down to not forget. Um, to, to understand their brilliance. And then to watch that cardinal, I watch them in the backyard, to watch how those birds fly through sort of these quarters that they can see through trees and shrubbery that we can't see. And you imagine this whole different world of, of sort of pathways and light that we know birds see differently that they can see that we can't. And so in that way, when you think of it that way, it puts birds, um, it pulls them from the ambient into the amazing. And if you can do that, if you can see those birds in that way, then you can't, you can't walk past them. And everybody has a bird story, as I say. So 
um, you know, those birds that feed us, those chickens that feed us um, on the dinner plate to those birds that feed our souls by soaring in the air. Um, it's all, all a pretty amazing thing and hard then to look past birds um, in your life. I love your turn of phrase the, from the ambience, the amazing. It's, it's clear, if I didn't know that you were a poet, I think that turn of phrase would, would certainly get the evidence of that. So that's <laughs> beautifully said. Oh, I do want to switch gears for just a Thank second, you. though, because, again, the, you are a prominent member of, of the Black birding community. And I think the fact that there is a phrase such as Black birder when there is not a phrase such as a white birder, that, that really speaks volumes about a, a lot of things. So why do you think there's a misperception about birding as being something that is um, maybe closed to, the, to members of the Black community or, or this misperception that it is an exclusively white pursuit? Well, demographically, I mean, as I said, it's, it's one of the whitest avocations out there. I mean, it, it's um, all you've got to do is go on, on most birding trips. And um, if you're a person of color, you're, you're more than likely going to be one, one or two of one or two that are there. So the demographics bear it out. The science um, bears it out that, that black birders specifically are, are, are somewhere around 1%, uh, maybe a little less than that, of American birders. So it's not that Black people don't appreciate birds, don't want to watch birds, but part of what's happened with birding uh, and bird watching is that it's, it's, it's also developed its own sort of culture. Um, and there are several sort of subcultures within the culture. And so those the culture, by definition, sometimes um, becomes cliquish, um, becomes exclusive as opposed to being inclusive. And so when we talk about um, cultures, we have to delve into what the culture um, of, of bird watching and birding is. Um, those cultures that are, are purposely sort of um, promulgated versus those cultures that are that are sort of subconsciously just there, right? So um, you know the 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 idea, for example, that you've got to go as I was speaking about all of these faraway wild places that require a, a great deal of time and an excess of money um, and the, the 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 privilege of being able to travel and all of those things. You know, some people hear that and they say, well, gosh, I would never, I would never be able to do that. I'm not going to go to New Guinea. Um, I can, I can barely get to, to New York. So why am I going to go to New Guinea? Um, and, and so one of the things that I think has to happen um, with birding is to understand that you can, you can watch birds wherever you are. That again, we've already talked about that. Birds are everywhere to be seen. So even those pigeons um, and house sparrows and European starlings that are easy to ignore. You're looking at three really extraordinary birds that are, are underappreciated for their, their, their abilities. I mean, the strong flight of pigeons, their homing instinct, um, the intelligence of European starlings and the resourcefulness of house sparrows. Um, all of those are amazing characteristics that those birds have but those happen to also be birds that are sort of many people would consider nuisances or throwaway birds. And so we, we sort of ignore their lives for quote unquote better birds, um, which I, I think is a mistake and, and teaches us then to sort of hierarchically organize life and devalue one life over another. So, you know, one of the things that I encourage people to always do is to think about birds in a larger context and to think about birds not just as beings to watch and, 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 and non-human beings to objectify, but to think of them as beings to celebrate for the unique characteristics that they have. I, again, you know, even though I saw butterflies flying, I saw bats in the evening flitting about, um, I neither wanted to be a bat nor a butterfly, I wanted to be a bird. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that has carried over to now into thinking about birds in these different ways. 
There is a, a short film that you produced uh, either with or for National Geographic, and I'm not sure which, which one it is, but it was back in 2016. It's a list of, of rules to follow uh, as a Blackbirder. And I, some of them like, uh, you know, never wear a hoodie and, and be ready to be confused with the other Blackbirder, which you mentioned earlier, it might be, you might have just two in a group. You know, they, they almost seem so outlandish that they could be construed as misconstrued as tongue in cheek. So were those all legitimate pieces of advice uh, based on your experiences of Black Birder or was any of that uh, exaggerated for effect? Oh, it, it wasn't exaggerated. And um, if, 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 if tongue is in cheek, it's in, it's, it's, it's in a cheek full of truth because um, all of those are, 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 are things that, um, that I've experienced in my, my black, my friends who are black and bird have experienced. So, um, yeah, it's a, you know, that, that piece, the written piece was originally inspired by the, the murder of Trayvon Martin. So, um, when we think about, um, when we think about life, when we think about you know, the, the disparities between black and white in this country, um, they carry forward into all aspects of life, you know, um, driving while black or shopping while black or, um, or birding while black. And so, you know, when I came up with that, that phrase in, in my book, it was because of lived experience. And I, I wish I could say, <laughs> I wish I could say that I had to exaggerate them for effect, but um, I didn't um, really. And, uh, and, and that's, that's I, I suppose, the, um, is the kind of the irony of satire, you know, that, that sometimes it seems like um, hyperbole is, is necessary, certainly in many cases to get a point across, but there's um, little to no exaggeration in most of in most of those those nine rules. Maybe it's a testament to my hopefulness um, in us as a society that, that I would see those as being um, dramatized. I'm sad that they're not. Um, and I could see especially how someone who lives that reality uh, as a black birder, how that would be very um, discouraging and would, would make you pessimistic about the future of, of the black community's involvement in something that obviously for you has given your life so much value and so much meaning and you've obviously derived a lot of enjoyment from it and purpose what then gives you a sense of optimism what what makes you hopeful about the the future of of black birding and um the involvement of black people in that pursuit well i you know i think it's um it's many things it's uh it's not giving, it's, it's learning not to give others the power to steal my joy. So not allowing someone else to take my joy by fear, intimidation, or dismissal, um, or disrespect. But then also seeing, for example, Black Birders Week and seeing this amazing cadre of, of, of millennials and Zers, Generation Zers, um, you know, take control of a narrative. And, and as, um, as the, the musical Hamilton, as the mantra there is, you know, who lives, who dies, who tells the story. And it's important for us to tell our stories and not to have others control our stories. So, you know, it's one of the things that I try to do as a writer um, and a, a speaker is to, is to speak the narrative and control my narrative. Um, and, and not to have it controlled by others. So I'm hopeful that others are listening. It's, it gives you hope that others are listening, that others are participating and not just black folks, but um, brown and, and white and red and other folks are, are, are listening and thinking um, about who it is that we all are and, and that we all sort of have this, these, these choices to make in life. And if watching birds is one of those choices, then we ought to be able to make that freely. So that gives me hope that, um, that BIPOC 
are are everywhere doing everything, including watching birds. It may be fewer of us, but more of us are um, are are sort of showing what we do that we're birding while black and biking while black and hiking while black and surfing while black and um, doing poetry on the inaugural stage while black. All of those things are important aspects of, um, of not just what a month um, celebrates, a very short month, but, but what a 402 year, almost 402 year history in this country um, bittersweet though it is, there is, is a lot to learn. Um, there's a lot to know, there's a lot to, to mourn, but there is, there, is, there is a good bit to celebrate. And birds help me celebrate the goodness that there is. And so I'm hopeful that there, there will be more good to celebrate, that there will be more diversity and inclusion. Watching birds is, is um, an act that leads me to care more intensely about the birds that I watch. And it's this feedback loop. The more I watch, the more I care. The more I care, the more I watch. And in between the caring and the watching is conserving. And in that midst, um, that's an act of love and care. And if I'm doing that, if I'm loving and caring for another being, that's gonna bleed over to other beings, other human beings, and the world gets better with that. That gives me hope. What would you like to see happen uh, in, in the years to come? If, if maybe last year's, the events of last year were the impetus for change, where would you like to see that change head? Is, it, is the ultimate goal that they're the uh, erasure of the term black birder to where there is no distinction that it's just a birder is a birder is a birder or what, where would you like it to go? Well, I, you know, I, I, I want people to do, I want people to ultimately be free and empowered to do what they want to do, um, to be able to exercise choices, whether it's watching birds or butterflies or rolling boulders safely, um, that, that people be empowered to live their lives um, as they would want, that they would be able to live out, you know, that the creed of this country and, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that just so happens that part of all three for me, life, liberty, and my happiness are wrapped up in birds um, and conservation. So I would, I would like to see um, the conservation conversation enjoined by um, a more diverse stakeholder group. And, and that means that the policymakers need to, need to sit back and listen and understand that, that the cause of environmentalism and conservation um, that it's a larger story that has been told um, in sort of the old homogenized way. So I'm hopeful um, with the changes that have happened over the past few months um, that that policy will will look forward and look more broadly, and that in that birds are going to be hopefully protected again in ways that was taken away. That wildness will be protected in ways, but that we'll also consider. Um, new, new, new people at all of the, the board tables and, um, you know, in the, in the, around the tables of decision making so that conservation writ large from things with fins to things with fur to things with feathers and warty toad skin um, that we all celebrate along with us and our human skins. That's what I'm looking forward to. And, um, and I'm hopeful that, that we're going to find a way to be better than we were, that we have been. So I'm looking forward to that. Dr. Drew Lanham, Drew, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us about birding, your love of birds, and the black birding community in particular, and your hopes for, for both of those things. You're very, very welcome. And thank you for the interview. And um, I love the Tennessee Aquarium. Please keep up the good work that you guys do there. Thank you very much.